It is Wednesday afternoon, September 13th, and we will in just a few moments be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 26, about verse 18. That's where we left off, and we'll talk about the wells, and we'll move forward. But at the end of class, we came up with a discussion about the Philistines and the Palestinians, if they are one and the same, if they are continuation, or what is going on. And because of the fact that it's a politically um, charged. charged, thank you, that's the word I want, politically charged. It, it, it is important to know, but our intent is not here to make a political, our intent here is to be studying the Bible. Um, okay, that sounds really bad because <laughs> with the word of God, we are involved in the political world. I think you all understand what I'm trying to say. Let me just jump into it. I'll give it to you on both levels. I said, and I believe, I believe that um, last week I said that you would maybe find in emails and that I would pass out a synopsis. There's so much behind this. I spent so many hours trying to research and bring it down that I'm still fine tuning it. I, I want to see how much I can get bogged down. I'm trying not to in class today. But look for that paper next week because I will give it to you. So if you're trying to frantically write, um, you don't have to worry about that. I will. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, but if you saw what I have in front of me, I don't want to scare anybody and think, oh, it'll be the whole class. But all of this is just trying to put together all of these sources. Then I have to go to the second layer and pull it together. So I don't want to inundate you with a term paper, you know. A, 30 pages. I want to give you one page, you know, here's the bottom lines, but this is where we get there. So forgive me as I try to navigate th through the waters a little longer than what I anticipated it would take me. But uh, to say what we need to for here in our scriptures, the Philistines that we see mentioned in Bereshit that were living in the land of Canaan, they were a people that really were neither Arab or Semitic. You know, the, the Jewish descent wasn't there either. The consensus really is more that they were, uh, they came from the area called Crete near Greece, that they were the Aegean Sea area between Turkey and Greece, that uh, they definitely had Greek influence in what, how they lived their lives. When they came through, they came, um, they were a seafaring people. They were, all my sources agree on that, that they were, um, Pit, pit, what do you call it? Not people of the sea, but you know, they, 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 they used the seas. And they had come down and they had tried to infiltrate in Egypt, which is south of Israel. In about the 12th century BC, Egypt was able to push them away and not allow them. And as they went up the coast, up the Mediterranean, then they settled in the area um, on the coastline of uh, what today is called Israel. Um, they settled in five cities mainly, and those were along the, the um, coastline, or I don't mean just exactly on, but very close in. Ashdod, Ashkelon, those are names you can look on an Israel map today and see that they're still there. And when I come up with my list, I, or remember, I'll tell you the other three cities. But um, they were not, as I said, they were not of Arab descent, which I thought that they were also were, but no, they, they were not at this point. Really, it seems that um, it crossed between Turkish and Greek with more of a Greek emphasis. They were European invaders, and, uh, um, and they, they were the f first enemy that we read of Israel dealing with when God's bringing her into the promised land. They also were one of her most constant thorn in the flesh. Maybe I shouldn't say constant, but Goliath was a Philistine. Delilah was a Philistine. All the way through history involved with our Jewish people from Samuel to David's time. In David's time, they, they were suppressed. But through that period of time, we see they were constantly um, troubled. Trouble to Israel, troublemakers, and never a help. When Israel even wanted to go through an area of their land, they were denied. 
Um, the closest we get to what the Bible tells us about where the Philistines came from, by the way, is in Amos, Amos, A-M-O-S, Amos 9, verse 7. And we read about their future also in Jeremiah 47 and verse 4. And that says that they came from the land of, and I don't know if I'm going to say it right, but I'm going to say Kaftor, C-A-P-H-T-O-R. That's modern-day Crete. So the, biblically, the Philistines that we read of, that's where they Can came from. Spell that again? Yes, but remember, I also will be giving it to you in a paper. But mm -hmm. C A P H T O R, Kaftor, Kaftor. I'll call it Crete because that's what we call it today. <laughs> okay, um, and they settled in what is now the southern part of Israel, the Gaza Strip that you hear that name given. That these as a people were obliterated by the 6th century BC. They believe that the final Philistine end of their line happened under the time of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that, that what was left was assimilated. Pretty much just what the Philistines did was they assimilated into the peoples that they came into being. That's the main difference between the Jews and the Philistines and others, the Jews never assimilated. They remained Jews. Uh, the argument is even, well, most of the Jews in Israel today came from Europe, or they came from here, or they came from there. Yes, but their DNA shows their connection back to further than those areas, and they never lost who they were as a people. What's called the Palestinian never had a land, never had a government, never had a culture, never had... Uh, a basis and root somewhere that they were uprooted from, cast out, and are fighting to get back. And if they were to claim that they were of the Philistines, there's no connection blood-wise, and they're lost from 600 B.C. all the way down to 1960s. Maybe you can see a couple of hints in 1940s. But, you know, we're talking over 2,500 years of nobody ever claiming to be a connector in all that time. And no DNA proves it either because they have even found a Philistine um, burial ground that is helping them connect the dots. It was found in 2016. And so they not only could DNA to get, you know, the, the bloodline, but they also could see from the burial ground what kind of... Um, of rituals, you know, they kept. What did they think of death? What did they think about life after death? How did they treat it? And they see the, the familiarity to what was Greek or Greece at the time that we're talking about. The pottery, there isn't a whole lot, but the pottery that was found in some of the graves, it matches within about a hundred years of what was found in Greece. And that hundred years very easily is the time that they came down, were down trying to fight in Egypt, came up, settled in Israel, began to, to live there, still with their ways of where they came from. And then as they assimilated to the people that they were around, not the Israelis obviously, but to others, they eventually just ceased to be a people. It's often said that the miracle of the Jew is the fact that they were out of their land for 2,000 years and yet remained a people, that that just doesn't happen. And I don't think there is any other example except the Jew to give you in that. We don't have Hittites. We don't have Amalekites. We don't have Girgashites. We don't have Hittites. A lot of these peoples did come to their ends. And God in Scripture often said, I'll make a full end of your enemies but I will not make a full end of you. So that fits and fulfills our scripture. As I mentioned under King David, that's about 10th century BC. You have the final break of Philistine power that we read about in the, the scriptures anyway. Um, and the land during all that time was not called the land of the Philistines. They had an area in the land of Canaan, in the land of Canaan. They never had the entire area. So there again, the the the, those of today who want to claim we have a right to the land because we came from the Philistines, well, that would only be five cities that you don't even have a right to because they did not continue. It's not continually theirs. Question? So what you're saying is they're not Bible people there. The Palestinian people are not Bible people, yes. Like they're not like Abraham, the Philistines, he, right. Abraham, is, he doesn't belong to that 
Right. 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 Yes. Yes. So yes. No. They they did not belong in that bloodline. No. No. Exactly right. Um, uh, the the biblical part, and I'm looking at my notes, even right perfect timing for what you're saying. They occupied the southern coast of what became known as Palestine, and I'll explain that in a moment. But it was 3,000 years ago the Philistines were there, and they were at that time enemies of the ancient Israelis, and they're portrayed in Scripture as crude and as a warlike warlike race. Just stating a fact, okay? Not meaning to. I not highlight them in my words, but just the, the fact. Now, um, I think I've covered that. Okay, i got to keep moving because I don't want this to take the whole time. During the Iron Age, it was stronger than bronze. During the Iron Age time, that's when you have Israel and Judah being two separate kingdoms. And it's during that time that um, they occupied the southern coast still. Uh, but Assyria conquered that region in 8th century BC. That's part of what took a good chunk of the Philistines um, losing identity. They assimilated into Assyria. And then when you have Babylon swallow up Assyria and control the whole area in, in the 600 BC, about 604, 605 BC, that's when you get to have what is considered by the majority of the historians I read, the end of the Philistine line. Okay, that's, that's where they date it to. Five cities, I've got it now, it was Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gath, and Ekron that was known as the land of the Philistines. And it was in the land of Canaan, in the land of Canaan, okay? It was later called Palestine by the Greeks. That's another reason why there's some confusion there. Um, but again, they came from Crete, from the rest of the Aegean Islands, they were more like the modern-day Greek than they were like the Israelis. Um, they were not indigenous to Canaan, to Canaan, and they gained control of the coastal plains for a time. Um, okay, I've done that. <laughs> I'm still putting it all together in my mind because you, you just you have to piece it all over. Now, what about that name? Because we hear the, the land of Israel called Palestine. Unfortunately, I wish we'd never heard that because that came from their enemy. The first time that it really was catching for the whole land area was in 135 AD. The Roman Emperor Hadrian was changing everything. They had conquered Israel. The temple had been destroyed in 70 AD. That was a major loss. And the second revolt against the Jews called the Bar Kokhba Revolt in 132 to 135 AD, those, the Jewish people that were the holdouts lost the battle then. At this point now, the Jewish people are scattered and they no longer are existing in the land of Israel as a whole people. Were there stragglers? Were there remnants? Yes, there always has been. That's typical. Even when Babylon carried off in three waves, they left the weak behind, they left the old behind, you know, they left the beggarly behind. But Adrian, Hadrian, I'm sorry, starts with an H. Hadrian had such a hatred that he wanted to erase any idea, any identity of Jewish presence in the land. So he changed it and called it Palestine. He used a Greek word that's Palestinian. I, I even know Greek. I barely. I'm not claiming to be a scholar. I took Greek, okay? P-A-L-A-I-S-T-I-N-E-I. -E That's the Greek form that gave the, the common name Palestine. The Hebrew Philistia uh, or Peleshet, which there's two different spellings. Rather than spell all out, I'll give it to you in your paper. Those two Hebrew names also morphed into Philistine, or I'm sorry, yeah, Philistine and then Palestine. <coughs> in our English. So it's just the way that the words went, but, um, and I interrupted my thought. I didn't finish my whole thought there. Um, oh, with, with Hadrian, he called Jerusalem Aelinina, I can't say Capitolina, okay? I'll give it to you on paper. But he gave them all Roman names. He was a Roman emperor. Rome had risen. Rome had squelched Israel. Rome was in control even when Yeshua Jesus walked on this earth. That's why when 
the uh, Orthodox, the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted Yeshua put to death. Had it been by Jewish hands, had they had the control, he would have been stoned to death. That was their mode of capital punishment. Instead, he ends up being crucified on a Roman cross because Rome had to give the, yes, we will put him to death. Otherwise, it would not have happened. And of course, that's all part of God's plan. He was to be crucified on the cross according to the prophecies, not stoned. So it, it had to be very clear. But there are those who even try to say that Jesus, and I'll use his English name, that he was a Palestinian, that he came from Bethlehem, and Bethlehem today is under Arab control. So they try to say, see, he came from Bethlehem, he was a Palestinian. Well, Sorry, folks, you can't just slap that on. That would be like saying somebody that's born in, in Texas today was born in Mexico because you go back in our history and that belonged to Mexico. You cannot do it that way. Yeshua, Jesus, was born Jewish to Jewish parentage. Mary being his earthly mother, he did not have a... a there was no sperm from Joseph that he was his representative, but both are Jewish anyway. He didn't have an earthly father. <laughs> okay, yes, the yes, spiritual one, the spiritual one, yes. Yes, yeah, so um, it was 1995 when Bethlehem was given into Palestinian National Authority, as they called it, with the Oslo Accords, with Arafat, with all that was going on, with the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, that was trying to raise all this up and claim they had rights to those areas. Well, that doesn't suddenly make Jesus a Palestinian. He was born to a Jewish home, he kept the Jewish law, he lived a Jewish life, and he fulfilled the Jewish scriptures. So when you hear people say these things, you just need to be thinking and you'll catch where their mistakes are and um, how to correct it. Um, the Philistine country, territory that they settled on, coming from the agency and then coming through, was one of the three ancient trade routes that came through ancient Israel. So it's no surprise that they followed that and brought their influence of Greek pottery and so forth into this, this side of the area. Um, the Philistines were a very superstitious people. They even carried their gods into battle with them. That's why when you read of the story when the Ark of the Covenant was taken into battle, which it should not have been, but when you read that, um, that's why they were fearful of the Ark. Plus, when they captured it, we all know, if you don't know the stories, it's a right. They put it in the, the building that had their image of their God. He falls on his face. The next day, after they put their God back up, he falls and his hands are broken off. You know, God was showing who was more powerful. But in the end, the Philistines really pretty much assimilated into the Canaanite culture that was around them. And then as th this area went off into Assyrian and finally Babylonian captivity, the testimony of the existence of the Philistine is gone. Um, now, Israel is a nation. Let me make that clear also. It, it's, it's called a nation. Palestine was given to the geographical region by Roman Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian. Um, and prior to 135, it was always called Judea, Galilee, Israel. Um, God still calls it Israel. He makes that very clear. I'll come up with a couple of scriptures for that in a moment, mm -hmm. too. Um, I think I've given you enough of this. This is a lot of that background that I'm trying not to just get bogged down and give you. Uh, I think I have said that. Coming in again a little bit just into our history in, in to where we are today, you have the, the Ottoman Turkish Empire was from about uh, 1500 into 1900. I'm going to say 1517 to 1917, but give me a little wiggle room on those years, you know, but the early parts of those two centuries. When it lost its power over all the area, it had Turkey, it had um, Syria, Lebanon, I don't remember what all it had. Anyway, that's when you hear about this British mandate. The British mandate of Palestine is what it, it, called, it was called. And in that region were Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And they all at that time called themselves Palestinian Jews, Palestinian Arabs, Palestinian Muslims, because it was a geographical location. I'm an American. 
okay because I'm in the land of America so that's how you see that name why it was called that you even have prior to 1948 you have the Palestine post from 1948 on it was called the Jerusalem post you would think well why did they call it that that's because it was the name given to the region it was spoken so loud so strong and for so long from the first century all the way up to the 19th to the 20th century that's why it was given but really if our Bible maps were accurate the Bible never calls that whole region Palestine it never uses that terminology it, it only calls the Philistines in the, the area of Philistia and it calls the whole region the land of Canaan Canaan and it goes on to call it Israel in fact I remember uh, my mom and dad talking that when it was coming up for a vote in 48 what the nation was going to be called Israel and Zion Zion are the two that it came down to and my folks said we knew it was going to be Israel because that's what the Bible says <laughs> and it did become Israel question uh, one thing too when prior to Israel being in the land um, even though the Arabs were there none of them claimed to be Palestinian at the time not until Arafat came along very true very true the Arab people as a whole never claimed that they were Palestinian until it begins to there's a couple of hints in the 1940s but get into the 1960s get into the realm of Yasser Arafat's influence <laughs> and that's where you have it and really they were given a chance when the British mandate came down and called that area Palestine British mandate was ready to make the two states that we hear today the two state solution quote yeah. I put that in quotes believe mm -hmm. me but they were told they were given a chance there would be an Arab state there would be an Israel state Israel agreed even though it was only going to give her a sliver of what God had given her but she felt it was better than nothing it was the Arab countries that disagreed and went to battle against Israel the next day to knock her out of the land she had just been given. So yes, there, there, there were not. I had another thought there. It, it ran through too fast. Can I retract it? Get it? Uh, it when it comes back, I'll say it because I'm looking to see if my notes help me, and they don't. Um, um, something there though about today. Dora, you've got a question. While I'm trying to think. Uh, okay, Alfred, you've said that they gave that um, the Israelites or whomever the name Palestine because we're trying to get at them. Why? I mean, what because because it sounded like well, well I'm not going to say sound like it was you know how language makes changes so when you go from the ancient language when you go from Greek and you go into English you you get very quickly from Philistine to Palestine you can see the etymology of how the the name worked and what their intent was is this was your first enemy that wanted to wipe you off into the sea we're going to do what your first enemy didn't accomplish so they chose that name and then you speak a lie loud enough and long enough the people believe it so you go forward through the second century third century and in fact that's where I can get into if I can find my notes fast on that in our biblical fathers um, you know the fathers of what's the church age that's where Eusebius in the third 300s if I can find that where he even helped it along by he didn't accept the name change of Jerusalem he called Jerusalem Jerusalem in his writings which the, these are the early church fathers that, it, that people revered but he did take the name Palestine and he helped forward it on in the third century he was one of those that was spoke of it as Palestine not as Israel which is what the Word of God only calls it it, it never calls it Palestine so it, it's speaking it carrying it you know the, the mistake is just carried on but yes they wanted to say to them in essence that your your initial enemy who wanted to wipe you off were in in their blood we're gonna do it now you know but God's not going to let that happen I'm looking for my notes on Eusebius any other questions while I'm looking I know this is what I forgot that thought I was going to say in 1948 when the Arabs were given a chance 
to have the land and, and have the two state and didn't, did, did not take it. Then again, in 1995, Oslo Accords, when they're all the peace talks were going on, you saw a lot of it over the news. That's our era that we've lived through. The Arabs had a chance again. Arafat was offered 95% of what he had come to the table wanting. My little prejudice side says I'm glad he didn't accept it <laughs> because it really was not in Israel's favor. But he chose to walk away and declare, no, I get 100%, which means no Israel, or we don't make peace with you. And that's really still the mindset of these that are fomenting that evil. It's not that they want to live side by side in peace. They want the peace called Israel. And they do want to wipe the Jews off of the map still. Their, their books, their literature, their teachings, what comes out of their mosques, all says it. I'm not spreading propaganda. This is what they say and what they show. To this day, they do not show a map with the name Israel on it. It has Palestine on it. And what they teach is, and they told the, the people in the land in 1948 and in 67, sorry, in 67, not in 48, when Israel recaptures Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem, they had some but not all of it, they told the Arab people, get out, the, the armies of the Arabs will wipe out the Israelis, and then you'll come back in and have your land, your house, and all the rest. The intent has always been to wipe them out, not live in peace. The Antichrist, I think, is the only one who is going to be able to, to get that lie across to get Israel to trust, to say, hey, we finally have a peace partner. This one will live side by side with us in peace. But like uh, Abba Eben said in 1995, when, when Arafat walked away from it, he said the Arabs never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> But why did Arafat walk away from it? Why was he so foolish as to have 95% and not take that? Was because he had been told by the Arab powers behind, and if you don't think that there are other countries behind, yes, there are. He was told, do you get 100% or you're a dead man? In other words, if we think you're compromising with Israel, we think you're working with Israel, we'll take you out and put someone in who will do it the way we want it. That's why he walked away. So a lot of people don't know that and wonder why he did, but really great evidence that, that that's what he was told. But yes? Like a lot of people say uh, they want Israel because of our oil, the oil is done like that. It's not so they just want the Jewish people done with Yes. Not so much me. Yes, Jewish. yes. Proof positive to that is things like when they gave land back down south to Egypt, Israel had greenhouses that were very productive monetarily. They would have been a great help to the Arab people. Israel gave them in great shape, even offered to train the Arab people who would come in how to do the job to keep it going so that it could be a money producer for them. And within, I think it's something like just a year, maybe it was a year and a half, all of that was destroyed. They didn't care about that. All they wanted was that piece of land back because they were trying to get everything they could away from Israel. Now, I'm not talking every individual person who is of Arab descent. There are a great number of Israeli Arabs who live in Israel, who are in the Knesset, who live very happily under Israel control, who are not of this intent. So when I talk about it, it's those who you hear that are pushing their agenda that are saying to stay or worse. And you'll hear the chants from the land to the, from the yeah, from the land to the sea, all of Palestine will be free. And they're talking all the way from Jordan to the Mediterranean. Well, where does that put it? the Jew? In the Mediterranean. In the sea, in the Mediterranean, yes, yes. But again, I do not want to anathemize anathemize a people of today. I do not want to sound like I'm just pro on one side. I'm not. I won't say everything Israel does is kosher, but I will say that it is her God-given right to that land. I will also bring out very clearly that Arab peoples are their cousins, okay? <laughs> We've got Isaac and Jacob. We're talking... I'm, Let's try Jacob and Esau, okay? I can go back to Isaac and Ishmael, okay? <laughs> Let's do Jacob and Esau because next chapter we're really going to get into Jacob and Esau. We know out of Esau came the Edomites. We know the other Arab nations came out of them. They are almost siblings. They're cousins, okay? 
didn't Yeshua Jesus die for them too? Yeah. And we know he did. And didn't he say, love your enemy? Now that doesn't mean be so foolish as to allow your enemy to push you into the sea. He's not saying that. But we should have the love of the Messiah, the love of Christ in us toward all people. And there should be fair and just and right for everyone to be able to live a balanced life. You know, I long to see that. But I know it will only be seen when thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Messiah is on this earth ruling physically, then the earth will see the thousand years of peace. But I, I just want to be very careful. I am not against the Arabs. I have friends that are of Arab descent and they know my love for them. I know their love for me. I saw my dad and our first tour guide in Israel and the first time when we went, when we went through Arab lines connecting with another group, I saw and we took pictures of my dad, an Orthodox Hebrew Christian, and our guide, an Arab Christian, with their arms around each other. And they had a great time together. So please understand I'm not against a I'm not against the Arabs. Let me just make that clear. But I am against the Palestinian notion that it's the land called Palestine is theirs and, and for any of those who connect themselves to the Philistines I'm just calling all that out for what is truth and the truth is not found in that so I hope that covers it doesn't just confuse you like I say I'll try to put it in a few paragraphs and get it down to one page and get it out to you <laughs> uh, just like They've been reported that there's a lot of Palestinians that live, the you know, Arabs that live in Israel. They oh, also said that I was going to say that not go back across that line because right. they're treated so much better. Right, right. What Roger's saying, if you're not hearing him, and I thought of it at one point too, um, because there is uh, areas that are being drawn up under Arab control, under Israeli control in the land, even as we speak now, there have been certain areas where the Israeli Arabs living there, hearing that this is going to go under Arab control, have made it verbally very clear if you do that to us, we're moving over onto the Israel side because we have a better life under Israel than we will have under our Arab authority. And so they're, they're siding with Israel, which shows the fairness that Israel does try to be to the Arab people also. Again, they're cousins, they, yeah. you know, and they want to live side by side. I will tell you in all truth, and I could give you case after case after case, when somebody's rushed into any one of the multitude of hospitals in Israel, no one stops them at the door and says, are you Arab or are you Israeli? And if you think you can tell the difference <laughs> just by looking at them, you'll be fooled. <laughs> yeah. But they're rushed in and they are treated, and even after it's known which they are, they are treated all the way through with whatever the treatment is that they need. It doesn't matter. I know literally of cases where Israeli eyes are in, you know, in Arab people now because the person died and they, they donated the eyes, the kidneys, you know, all these. We've got story after story on both sides, you yeah, know, where they so. are, you know, willing to and wanting to share that kind of a, um, you know, both live and live in peace. Yeah. Sadly, the political world gets in its way. And uh, we know really it's an attempt by Satan because, um, and this is my closing, Satan's fury is against Israel. It's also against the church, the called out assembly. Don't miss that. Revelation 12 verse 5 where Satan goes after the, who gave birth to the Messiah, that's Israel, and goes after the, the believers also. I'm saying that terribly. Let me read you Revelation 12 because it says it so much better than I just did that I want you to see. Uh, verse 5. The whole chapter is about Israel. There's controversy over that. I'm not here to teach Revelation 12 today, but I will tell you I believe Revelation 12 is on the bit.ly site. I, site. I hope it is. If not, I'll get it up there some. Uh, but when I taught Revelation, if you can get in touch with me, I can get you CDs. I, I went into the depth and how there are different views and how they're not right. Verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who's going to rule with a rod of iron? Christ. Christ. 
Messiah. And remember, Christ means Messiah, okay? So, who gave birth to the son? For unto us a son is given, and to us a child is born. Israel, okay? So, we know this is talking about Israel. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. When Messiah lifted up on, on, on a, okay, 40 days after he had resurrected and 10 days before Pentecost or Shavuot. Remember when he was caught up Acts 1? That's what this is referring to. He was caught up to the heavens. He went back up into heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father right now. Verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness for she had a place prepared by God. Israel's going to hide in the wilderness, a place God's uh, protected her or will protect her for 1,260 days. Um, that's not the verse I wanted. That's where it starts, but where does it say? Um, okay, verse 13, when the dragon saw his thrown down to the earth, that Satan, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child. Then it repeats again how she was able miraculously to go into hiding. The serpent poured water, this is verse 15, like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. He sends an army after Israel to try to get rid of Israel. He doesn't succeed. The earth um, swallows up the river, that's symbolic speech, but what it's saying is that she, she got into a hiding place, physically a hiding place. So verse 17, so the dragon was enraged with the woman, enraged with Israel, went off to make war with the rest of her children, the ones who didn't get into hiding, He's going after them. That's the rest of the Israelis that didn't pay attention in Matthew 24, 15, when it said, when you see the abomination desolation placed in the most holy place, flee. Get out, go. Don't even go in your house and grab a sweater. Just get out because if you don't get out fast enough, you won't be able to get out. So those who didn't get out are the ones that he's going to go after when the ones that God is protecting are protected. But then notice the next phrase, and then I'll get you. The next phrase says, um, well, let the, again, repeat, and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God. Okay, that sounds like the law. That sounds very Jewish. And then it says, and hold to the testimony of Jesus, of Yeshua. Who holds to the testimony of Yeshua? Christians, believers in Jesus. If you're holding the testimony of Jesus, you're claiming Jesus is your Savior. So at this time, the midpoint to the end of the tribulation, Satan's going after a vengeance, after Israel and after true believers. And you're saying, oh, that means we're here. No, <laughs> we weren't here in the original Testament. You call Old Testament times either, were we? And there were believers in the coming of Yeshua, Jesus. They looked toward the cross. We look back. God has always had a remnant of believers through all time, all the way from the beginning, all the way through. These are those who came to saving faith after we've been raptured, after, uh, during the tribulation period. They get saved. Satan's enemy is the Christian. Satan's enemy is the Jew, is Israel. So because she's got such, I'm sorry, because he, Satan's got such a fury, such a wrath against God, against God's rule, against God's reign, against God's plan for his son to sit and rule and reign on this earth. He's doing everything he can to knock that out. If he can wipe Israel off of the map into the sea and set up his own kingdom, Messiah can't come back, can't do what he's supposed to do, can't lead the world into that peace that Satan does not want. He wants the rule. He wants it his way. And so he's stirring in the hearts of people all along. Get rid of the Jew. Get rid of the Jew. Get rid of the Jew. Wipe Israel off the face of the map. Go after those Christians because those Christians help the Jews. Those Christians are on God's side. I want them on my side. I want them to worship me. That's why through the Antichrist, bow down and worship me. Satan's indwelling that Antichrist and saying, you're worshiping Satan. That's his intent. So that's why it's still going on and will go on until Messiah returns, Revelation 19, and with the sword out of his mouth, finishes off the enemies of Israel. 
And there's actually one other little time Satan's let loose after the thousand years, but he goes down in a blazing defeat because he gets cast in the lake of fire forever. And forever doesn't end, folks. If it does, it's not forever. Forever is forever, just as our salvation is forever also. Loretta. And what you were saying about them uh, running for Heidi in Revelation, that's a Petra. Uh, we believe it is Petra, that's yes. Petra. That's really, yeah. uh, it's only made for a one person to go in, and that's why it's so hard for the enemy to even think he can get in there. He can't. He probably won't even try once they get without, you know, immediate reach. Because, yes, what she's talking about is the entrance into Petrus through an area called the Seek. I have literally done it. I've had the privilege of being there and seeing it, and it is amazing. But it does come down to when you're on horseback, which you need to be because you're going through the desert and a horse can move faster than you can, you have to go through single file. So it's not a way that the enemy can come in and go after those who are in there. Once you're through, you're inside safe, and he'll probably think, Good. They'll die down there. What are they going to eat? Where are they going to get water? How are they going to survive? They'll just, you know, they'll do it for me. I don't have to waste my time and energy on me. They'll, they'll die off. There. But there's, <laughs> there's an aqueduct system. There's places for cisterns. We know that God can bring the waters from heaven. The rains can be channeled through those ancient aqueducts that did make the land uh, fertile at that time. We know that God can feed them. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. He fed <laughs> he fed two and a half million plus for forty years. You think he could do that same thing again yeah. with less people and less time? <laughs> it's called man in Hebrew, manna in our English. And yes, I absolutely believe if that's how God chooses to do it, he will rain manna out of heaven every day. They'll pick it up and they'll eat it. And they'll know God is their sustenance and their provider. Because the ones who have fled are the ones who are listening to the word of God, who got the message, and they fled. So, Okay, without going more in Revelation, which we could easily tip into, if there aren't any questions, I hope it gives you some background and some understanding, because we're dealing with a political level and a biblical, and I really tried to stay more to your biblical, because that's our purpose here today. Yeah, that gives me more of an understanding of why they keep coming after Israel. They what? Because they're so prosperous that they don't realize it's God that's blessed them. So they want their land because of the prosperity and everything that they got in there. Yeah, but, but you just said a key thing. God has blessed them because he said, I'll bless the Jew to bless the world through the Jew. Mm -hmm. And we see it in their inventions in every area, science, medicine, whatever you name. We do see it. We do see how they are blessed. And yes, they, they want that, but they don't realize that's God-given. And God's doing it to bless the world. You know, like we're saying, there are Arabs treated in the Israeli hospitals that wouldn't be alive today without what Israel has developed. They're amazing on cutting edge. And amazing. I that, you know, a lot of your famous Jews that are, they had to change their name so that they can continue their, <coughs> what they're doing. Especially they coming out of, it, yeah. It would be targeted. Yeah, especially coming out of the World War II and the years that followed, absolutely, there's a lot that's still <coughs> hidden. Um, that's why some Jewish people are only finding out now my family was Jewish, mm -hmm. because it was hidden from them. But hopefully I've given you enough to take us now back into, um, in where, well, we're not dealing with the Philistines right now, but we'll deal with them again. They're, they'll come up again. <laughs> and I don't remember how it did last week, or I would jump to that point now. But let's go ahead and just jump in. No wonder it didn't look right. It was still in Revelation. <laughs> okay, back in Bereshit, in um, chapter 26 of Genesis, we had that there was contention between Isaac, Yitzhak. Remember, he went down toward Egypt. He didn't get as far down as Egypt, but he was following what his dad did. When there was famine in the land, the famine we saw was about 100 years apart. Avraham went down into Egypt for food. When there was famine in the land, Yitzhak started the same way. God had told Abraham, Avraham to go to the land, and God would, would give him the land that he would show him. Avraham should have stayed in the land, trusted his God. He got in trouble down there. It's where he almost 
uh, compromised Sarah, Sarah his wife, and yet he stood at the correction and came back into the land. Now, God had told Abraham, you have to go to get this land. You know, he had to be obedient. Isaac was, it was told that God said, I will give this land to Abraham and to his descendant. And he makes it very clear it's to Isaac, and then he'll make it very clear again it's to Jacob, not to Esau and not to Ishmael. But all Isaac has to do, he doesn't have to be obedient and go to the land, he's in the land. He has to stay in the land. The son of promise is not to leave the land of promise. And God stops him, and he does stop at God's correction in Gerar. But he settles in Gerar for a time. We saw this last week. And as he's being blessed so abundantly, amazingly, a hundredfold, first time we're even hearing about farming, and his farming is flourishing like any farmer would love to have a hundredfold in their crop. They're growing. In this area, because it's desert, they need water. They are not going to get enough natural rain. So they need to find a source of water. Cisterns were good because they could gather the water when the rain was there. But rain, uh, water that stays in a holding tank doesn't stay good forever. It gets pretty stagnant. And it's always better to have a continual source not what's dependent on the rain coming again. So they, they would also be looking for the natural springs. That's why they go digging for wells, because where do you find natural springs is underground. You tap into it and you bring the water up. So um, lot, uh, I'm going to go a lot. I don't know why. Isaac <laughs> um, and his men, we saw that they... Uh, went to the area of wells that Avraham had dug, his dad, they were his dads. Remember Avimelech had told uh, Avraham, settle wherever you want, it's yours, blessing to you, just don't bring this condemnation on my house because you put me in jeopardy, pray for me that I do not see death and prosper because Avimelech was told in a dream by the God of Israel, by the one true and living God, you're a dead man if you touch the wife, and you're also a dead man if he doesn't pray for you. So Avimelech conceded, and Avraham was blessed. He did dig wells, but after Avraham had left the area, and we have a long time, because remember Isaac hasn't come down here for about 100 years now, the Philistines, that, that's where we got the Philistines in the picture. Hello, it's right here. It's in verse 18. The Philistines stopped them up after the death of Abraham. As long as Abraham was alive, he had access to those wells because Avimelech gave it to him. So being a nomadic people, he would move his, his herds to where the source of food and all was better. But then they could grow back in the area where it was. He could go back. So as long as Avraham was alive, they didn't have the chutzpah <laughs> to plug up those wells. But once he had died, they didn't want others to come settle in that area. They didn't want to live in that area. They wanted to stay in their cities where they were, so they just plugged up the wells. They stopped them up, probably just piled dirt on dirt on dirt on dirt. <laughs> but uh, what we do see, because in, in a lot of ways in Yitzhak's life, he's exemplary. He's a picture of Messiah for us. From the time that he was almost sacrificed, it was a picture of a Messiah who would be sacrificed. And in this, in him coming to the wells that were stopped up and reopening them, is a picture of Messiah coming, of Messiah reopening the well of living water um, to those that have been blocked by it because of rituals, ceremonialism, the role that the people put on, the leaders put on the people that made it impossible to try to be obedient to God's word. So it's, it's a refreshing that came to the land, the same way when Messiah came, there was refreshing to those who came. Even, I can take it right down to the woman at the well. Okay, now this was not Abraham's well, this is Jacob's well, Yaakov's well. It's up northern, higher than Gerar down south. But the principle is the same. He sat at a well where a Samaritan woman, half Israeli, half Arab. We've got our myths. Uh, they're not, they don't get along. Um, the Samaritans want to worship in a different place than what God had said. 
the Israelis who were staying true to God wanted to worship only in Jerusalem, only at the temple where they felt it was right. There were other issues between the people also, but Yeshua went and sat by that well. The Samaritan women came. The Samaritans and Jews, he talked about the Hatfields and the Koi's. They wouldn't even talk to each other. So when he, a Jew, asked her, a Samaritan, for water because she came with her pitcher and was dipping down into the water, she looked at him like, why are you a Jew asking me, a Samaritan? And the Lord just spun it on her. Don't get sidetracked with that. If you knew, knew who I was, you'd ask me for a cup of water from me because you'll never thirst again. Oh, whoa, I don't want to have to come to this well. I don't want to have to do this hard work. I want that water that I, I'll never have to be thirsty again. How do I get it? And he tells her about herself. She realizes the only one who could know all this about me, that has to be God. Are you the one that was to come from God? And of course he is. And she goes back and tells the city. And everybody turns out many got saved because he stopped at a well and refreshed and brought the refreshing waters of salvation to the people. What a beautiful picture for us. They didn't understand at all. They. He's talking to a woman, he's talking to a Samaritan woman, you know, what's he talking about? Yeah, yeah, keep reading, but I won't get sidetracked on that lesson because we're here. So, where did I put my two extra pages? Did I cover them up? I did. Okay, just as a refresher, back in chapter 24, when um, we looked at verse 62, if you want to look it up later, it talked about Isaac journeying to Beer Lahoy Roy, the way of the well. We see that seven times with Isaac, he's associated with wells. In 2462, it was Lahoiroi. That's the living one who sees me. Remember, he gives the names, uh, he names the wells with the meaning of what's going on. Okay, in 2511, it's Bir Lahoiroi, the way of the well, of the, one, the living one who sees me. Then we read of Abraham's well here in chapter 26. As we go down, we're going to see the, the wells are called Essek in verses 19 and 20. Sitna, and I may not be pronouncing them right. I'm not telling you I, I know everything. Verse 21, and Rehoboth, Rehoboth in 22. And finally, Shiva, or it'll, it'll look like Shiva or Sheba to you in uh, verses 25 and verses 33 in this chapter. So I won't give you the meaning of those names till we go down through those verses, which we're going to do right now. But again, remember Isaac very much is associated with the wells in his life. I see seven times a complete picture. And when we see Isaac as a picture of Messiah, the living well of salvation, I, that's the, what I draw from that. Now, Isaac didn't want to fight the um, Philistines. So when there's trouble, he, he, he just gives in, he concedes, he moves, whatever. He could probably have defeated them. But I think that he realized all that would do is cause more and more alienation. It would cause more and more battles. So he chose to leave, I'm going to say quietly, you know, rather than this is mine, I have a right, and I'm going to defend it. That, was not just, that wasn't his take. We'll see why as we go on. I think I'm, I'm ready. I think we did, um, yeah, I think we can just pick up in 18. Yitzhak dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of his father Avraham for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Avraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them, showing he knows this was his father's well. He became heir of what his father had, so he has a right to it also. But verse 19, when Yitzhak, Isaac's servants, dug in the valley, and found there a well of flowing water. Now you've got a spring. You've got a great a flowing water. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Yitzhak, of Isaac, saying, this water, the water is ours. Okay? Remember, Yitzhak is dwelling there. He's dug the well. His people have done all the labor. This is still in the area that Abraham was given favor in. Isaac had every right to dig a well and the well should be his. But as soon as they had paid her, along come the herdsmen that live in the area in Gerar, and they're like, no, that's ours. You dug that for us. That's ours. And again, instead of Isaac arguing with him, he names the well Essek, 
which means argue, it means contention, it means dispute, but instead of arguing, he moves on, okay? So then they dug another well, I'm in verse 21, and they quarreled over it too, so he named it Sitna, and Sitna means hatred, it means opposition, argument, you know, striving, and all of these words, okay? So um, these are two times now that Yitzhak has attempted to dig his own wells. Okay, you stopped up my father's wells. You didn't want us using my father's wells. I've dug my own well. You, what was the first one? You contended with me. You dispute with me. Okay, I'll move and I'll do another one. Second well, you're quarreling with me. There's a hatred here. There's an opposition here. And so he's going to move away from there also. Now, he's still dwelling near the wells of his father. And often children will go back to the ways of their father and they'll follow the, the footsteps, what's been laid down for the father. So parents realize your responsibility, what you're teaching and showing your children often does affect them. If not, if you don't see it in the media, you'll see it later in their lives. But as we go on um, after Sitna in verse 21, then verse 22, then he moved away from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. He had have gone, hooray, yay, hallelujah. Now they've got a well that there's not contention, there's not fight, there's not argument, there's not opposition, so he named it Rehoboth. Okay, Rehoboth means enlargement, it means a broad place. Um, to put it to a well, it was the well of ample room. There's room for everybody. We are finally getting along. Now, again, he's gone and he kept moving instead of fighting till he found a place where there could be peace. That was his goal. He was a man of peace. And again, in that, he pictures Yeshua for us. When we read and go with me to 1 Peter, 1 Kepha, chapter 2 and verse 23, we read, whoops, okay, there we go. I've got to get there with my tablet, sorry. First. Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, where we read, And while being reviled, he, Yeshua Jesus, did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. We know that the whole time they put Yeshua Jesus on trial, we know that all they put him through, all the false accusations, everything that they did, he did not open his mouth. He went like a lamb led to the, the shearers that's silent. In this same way, even though he was being abusive, abuse, abused, it was abusive, <laughs> he was being insulted, he did not insult in return. That's what the Hebrew is saying. And Yitzhak here is a picture for us of that. It was finished without strife. There was plenty of room now in the land for both of them. And this was probably a little more out of the area known as the Gerar Valley and getting closer back to that original, the well at Beersheba, where, um, where his dad had, had his place before he had gone down south also. So, in seeing that, we see that the language given to us back in Genesis 26 is that Yitzhak went up. And I've got to get there myself. He, um, oh, I didn't finish the verse. I'm sorry. So he named it Rehoboth, for he said, At last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. Now we've got a well. We can use the well with water. We can have our crops. We can water our herds, we can live life, so he, he was showing that, that um, satisfaction, I will put it that way, okay, and again, Rehoboth is closer to Beersheba, if we could, we can't see it on the map today, but he's moving in the area, going back up, remember he started down, down is never a good way to go, okay, notice what happened when he went up, because verse 23 makes that very clear, he went up from there to Beersheba. So he's going from Rehoboth to Beersheba now, Beersheba in your English. That's also at the same time, even though he's physically doing it, is showing us a spiritual ascent. He's spiritually turning back the way he should. Remember, he should never even started 
for Egypt looking for food. He should have been looking to his God to provide. Now his eyes are back. He's back in communion with God. And we're going to see that because of what, what happens here at Beersheba. Um, I have to wonder, you know, God moves through even our enemies. He spoke through a, a heathen king, Avimelech, Abimelech, to speak to Abraham, to speak again to Isaac. God will use whatever means. And maybe God worked in those herdsmen in Gerar to just keep pushing Isaac because he wasn't going all the way back. He was going part back. A lot of people, believers, want to make compromises. Well, I'll be sold out to the Lord here, but I'm going to hold on to this. Or, uh, you know, I'll do this most of the time, but I need a little room for me. You know, we find all kinds of ways to justify our, well, I just need that rest. I'm going to use something that, that I'm using it very loosely, but because I'm thinking of it with water. Oh, I know I should go to church, but I only have one day off. And that beach, I just need, I'm so tired, I just need to go rest on the beach. I need to be by the waters instead of choosing to be by the living waters that would have refreshed soul as well as physical. So it's just a lesson to us. Don't compromise. Don't go halfway. If God wants you somewhere, go the whole way. If he calls you to, to step aside from something, don't argue it. Don't find a way around it. Go. Hook, line, and sinker. 100%. He finally goes back to Beersheba. Beersheba is the well of the oath. This is where God made that oath with Avraham. As soon as Isaac's back in that place in right communion with the Lord, what happens? I love it. Verse 24. And the Lord appeared to him the same night. His first night, as soon as he's back to Beersheba, the Lord appears to him. It's almost as if Beersheba was hallowed territory, like he got back to the ark, he got back to the temple, he got back to the tabernacle, however you want to put it. Because we're going to see here where the Lord makes himself known to, to Yitzhak. I'm going to cheat before I tell you what said. Look at the first part of verse 25. So Isaac built an altar there. Okay, that, that shows He's right with God. He's going to put an altar there. What do you build an altar for? To give thanks. To give thanks, to worship, to honor, to honor whoever you're making that altar to. Isaac was making it to the one true and living God, the God of his father, the God of Abraham, who is also the God of Yitzhak. So this, this was absolutely the, the right thing to do. But I love the fact that as soon as he was getting back on track, God meets him. There was no hesitation with God either. He didn't say, well, I'll wait and see if you stay here. You no, know, God will meet you if you get off the road that he wants you on. As soon as you come back, you will find out God didn't move. God didn't leave. You're the one who wandered off. As soon as you come back, God is there. He will meet with you there. He appears to, to Yitzhak. And I can only imagine the fellowship that they had had as the Lord spoke to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Okay, I am. You're, you're talking to the God you saw, your dad, who you were even willing to sacrifice your life to also. I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. Remember when he went down for food? He's fearing famine. He's fearing the lack of sustenance. He's fearing the lack of his physical needs to be met. And God's saying, don't fear, for I am with you. And I encourage you, whatever trial you are at in your life, don't let go of the hand of the Lord. He's holding on to you. You have to let go of him to walk away. Don't let go of the hand of the Lord. Trust him. He will be with you. And he goes on and he says, I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants. And then he says why he's doing it. Because you're a good boy now, Yitzhak. Because you're doing things the right way. No, not totally. It is true that he had to behave. He had to be where he was supposed to be to receive these blessings. But God said, I'm going to do it for the sake of my servant, Avraham. Now, does that mean that Avraham earned it for Yitzhak? No. God promised Avraham. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your descendants. 
So God was under oath in essence to Abraham. He had to keep his word to Abraham. So I'm going to bless you, Isaac, because I made this oath with Abraham. And what God was saying to Yitzhak is, I am faithful. Even when you are not, I am faithful. And I think many of us know there are times when we've just been given something on the basis of grace and of mercy. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We maybe shouldn't have gotten so blessed and we just say thank you Lord and we get right back into where we really ought to be there was no mention of an altar in Gerard Isaac didn't worship the Lord down there he wasn't going that way so what we see in that spiritual progress the moment he took a step back in the right direction he's on track now with the Lord the Lord appears to him when we spiritually can't see the Lord and I don't mean by physical sight but when we don't know, when we know that there's a distance, it's because we've moved away, not because the Lord has, and we need to get back where the Lord wants us to be. So the Lord appears. I'll get you in one second. He builds an altar. He's enjoying the presence of God. He's enjoying worshiping God. We're going to see he, does it say it here? Yes, it does. Let me finish verse 25, and then I'll get to you, Dora. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, that's the worshiping there at the altar and he pitched his tent there and I say good boy he's gonna camp out right there he's saying I have my citizenship in heaven this earth is not where I'm gonna put down permanent roots this is not where I belong I'm not an earth dweller I'm a citizen of heaven and he's showing that he had that same pilgrim character that same heart that Avram had when he left his homeland went to the land that God would show him, but it says that Avraham never settled. He kept looking for the city that was made by God, not made with, with human hands, that's Hebrews 11. So in the same way, Isaac's doing the same thing. I'm not settling in a place where I'm saying the earth is my home. I will pitch my tent where the presence of the Lord is, build an altar, worship him there. I will show him I am ready to, to you tell me pick up tent move when the cloud lifts all go and the final out of that is he did a well or his servants dug a well okay what do we get from the well refreshment refreshing waters the picture of the living water of salvation here where he dug this well there's no philistines to hinder there's there's no enemies at all he is in a place of real victory because he's in right fellowship with the Lord. The Lord has met him there. He's worshiping the Lord. He's honoring the Lord. He's drinking at the well of salvation. And he is being blessed. So beautiful, beautiful picture. When we're right spiritually, this is the way we move. We see Abraham build altars. This is the one time we see Yitzhak build an altar. He took a lesson from his dad. We see Isaac, the man of the wells, as I've said, in the wells being the picture of the living water. And then we're going to move on to Yaakov, Jacob, and we're going to see that Jacob was a man of tents. He's going to camp, and he's going to camp, and he's going to camp, and he never settles either. So we have in all three of these that entire picture. Abraham, a man of altars, yet the place to worship God. Yitzhak, a man of wells, where we dig into the, the living waters of our refreshment. And Yaakov, living in the tent saying my citizenship's in that city in heaven I'm not putting down roots in this world I belong in heaven not of this world for all you see those on cars still okay what a beautiful picture we have in our three patriarchs passed down to us now well, am I too my late was, gonna be, was this his first altar I mean, this the first time we have it mentioned yes Yes, so I'm going yeah, to believe it is, and that he built, that Isaac built. What yes, that? yes. Uh, the last verse, 25. Um, he built an altar there, and the he is Isaac. The very last verse in the chapter. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. 
I had my tablet, I needed to scroll down. It's not the last verse. It's <laughs> it's the final in that paragraph, but sorry. <laughs> we've got we've got a number of verses to go. We're not moving into the next chapter. I'm <laughs> I'm human folks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so it, it's verse 25, Loretta. Uh, my tell had a great length there, and I thought it was coming up with the next chapter. So, um, <clears throat> any questions, though? Comments, questions? Well, I have one, because, you know, back to the Palestines, because this man is their king, so how can he be their king if there was no such... King was like a mayor, or like a governor. Okay, it wasn't. Can be a king as long as I am going to be king today. Yeah, as long as I'm a leader and I got the people living around me, following me. Remember in chapter 14, Abraham had five kings come up against four kings. Mm -hmm. How could you have nine kingdoms <laughs> in that little area? So it's, it's a title they gave them that's been translated that way to us. We're even going to see a couple other titles come up here that, like, even we saw Abimelech. Um, Avimelech, the same name, a hundred years apart. Very mm -hmm. unlikely, it's the same man. It's probably his son or his grandson. It was a title. We're going to see the title fecal, and we're going to see that fecal is a person who influences the king, but he doesn't have political power on his own. You know, he's an advisor. So we have titles, we have names. When we think king, we think big, and we think kingdom. But here, it's like mayor. And it could be a little city, or it could be a bigger city, depending on how far their influence went. So, and I will just say, because what we said earlier, even though I know you understand, you you called it the pal you called it Palestine or Palestinian. I forget what you said, but it's Philistine, Philistine. So just be just to make it clear. Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments, Zoom room. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Then we'll move on with verse 26. We're going to see when Yitzhak is enjoying God's presence that men around him will fear him. And I don't mean, oh, you know, I'm afraid. I, I'm respectful. Yes, they were afraid. You're powerful. You're strong. We respect you and your God. You know, we're going to see that that happens. They didn't show Yitzhak that kind of attitude when. He was in their midst out of the presence of God. They fought, they quarreled, they contended. They said, it's ours. You got to do the labor, we get the profit. <laughs> you know? So what a difference in attitude we're going to see. We are going to see that he was a man of strength. He was not a weak man or they would not have worried about him. And let me give you um, a proverb, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 7 that I think could fit his life. Okay, I just do not have a tablet that wants to cooperate today. There we go, Proverbs. And this time it wasn't me, it really was my tablet. <laughs> Proverbs 16, not to say it won't be me the next time. Proverbs 16, verse 7 says, When a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he causes even his enemies to make peace with him. That's a great proverb to try to put into effect in your life that you are um, in the presence of your God so that he can, um, and obedient, you know, would be um, the ways pleasing to the Lord is how it said it. That in that way, then the Lord can work even to bring your enemies to peace with you. And I think we can all say that we've seen that at times in our lives where those who want to come against us for something, it doesn't mean they're literally wanting to take our lives. But they're, they're contending with us or arguing with us or causing, you know, an upset. And we've seen the Lord smooth away and bring peace. So, um, you know, we're told as much as possible, live at peace with all men. Uh, it just goes along with the fact when you're walking with the Lord and he has control, he can work in your circumstances. When you fight for control, then you limit what he is able to do for you. So Yitzhak is in a good place. I want us to see that. If you make a mistake, if you go down spiritually, it's not all over. God doesn't say, well, I can't trust you. I'm done with you, out with you, and in with the new. No, he's willing to bring us back in, back into that place of fellowship, back on track, and continue to work through us. Does that mean that we should have that kind of behavior? Anybody like the woodshed? 
I think we're all going to agree, let's stay right and not need to be corrected and not need to come back. But here we are now, uh, Avi Malik comes to Yitzhak from Gerar. So he comes up to the Beersheba area because as far as we know, Yitzhak is near the, the well at Beersheba. And uh, Avi Malik comes up with Ahuza. Now, you can give me an A or an F for the pronunciation. Um, Ahuzat is close to the Hebrew, and Picho, or uh, Fiko, however you want to say it, depending on English or Hebrew, the commander of his army. Okay, this would be, um, sometimes it's called a privy counselor, sometimes it's just named as an aide, but as I said a few moments ago, this would be one who had a high-ranking position politically. He's one of the king's advisors, he's one of his right-hand men, but he doesn't have power to act on his own. So the people aren't looking to him, they're looking to the king, that he's got great influence guiding that king. So Abimelech hasn't come up alone, he's brought with him his counselors his, to help him be wise and, and maybe also to show to Yitzhak, we're, we're not coming as in war, we're coming here to, hey, let's figure something out. Let's work on this, okay? So they come in and Yitzhak says to them, why have you come to see me since you hate me and you sent me away from you? Remember, they told him, get out, you know, and they didn't work with him. They wanted him to move away. So Yitzhak's kind of saying, okay, what are you doing? Why are you here? I got out. I'm out of your area. Why are you up here bugging me? <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, let me show you uh, fecal or um, pichol. That's my Hebrew. In chapter 21 and verse 22, we see how that's a title. No, wait a minute. We're, yeah, 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 yeah. Go with me to Genesis 21, 22. Just to back up what I'm saying so you see when I tell you it's a title where I get it. Genesis 21 and verse 22. This is back after um, um, Isaac has been born. This is when Abraham is going to make um, a covenant with Avi Melech. In verse 22, it's again, now it came about at that time that Avimelech and Fikol, Pichol, the commander of his army, spoke to Avraham. So again, we've got same names, but it's a hundred years later. I cannot imagine that a man that was, that was strong in leadership a hundred years later isn't a weak old man if he's even alive. You know, so it just shows us that these are titles that are repeated. The same way we'll see Pharaoh used, and we know a different Pharaoh came up that didn't know Joseph. Okay, it's the titles that are used. So, they've come up together. Um, Yitzhak wants to know why, and I'm getting back to that. We are in verse 28, I think. Yes, okay. Isaac calls them out. You hate me. Why are you here? And they said... We have seen plainly, verse 28, that the Lord has been with you. So we said, an oath must now be taken by us, that is by you and us. So let us make a covenant with you. What are they saying? You're a blessed man. Look at you. You're strong. You're powerful. We want you. We want to be allies. We want to be friends. We want to know you're going to be friendly with us, not take over us, not come at us in revenge. We want to make peace with you. And making a covenant is the same thing in our Hebrew. It's the same expression, cutting a covenant. So they want to go into a covenant that's saying, if either of us breaks this covenant, then we should become like animals on each side of us, dead animals. We should become dead. So now that he's out of their face, so to speak, and they're seeing how good it goes with him, they want to be on good terms and they want to have a peace treaty. Okay, I can say it that way. They want to have a peace treaty. So that's what they present to him in verse 28 and verse 29 tells Yitzhak why. So that you will do us no harm. Just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. Eh, we could argue that, but they did go after him. They did make it hard for them to leave. They, in essence, in that way, maybe so. And so uh, they say, you are now the blessed of the Lord. Okay, well, Isaac was peace-loving. We saw that already. He didn't stand up and fight for his father's wells like his father did. When they took his father on, his father did defend and did um, stand up for his rights. But Yitzhak 
Um, maybe he didn't have that character about him. He, maybe he just, you know, there are those who are fighters and there are those who are not. Um, and if you want where Abraham rebuked Avimelech and his men for taking their wells, that was back in chapter 21 also where we just came from, verse 25. You can go back and look at it on your own. Um, but just saying, you know, the difference between the, the two men, we see that Isaac's going to go into covenant with them. And when it says, I think we're ready for verse 30, then he made them a feast. That would have been a ceremonial feast. It wasn't, um, oh, let's sit down and have a meal. They made a ceremony out of it. We're going to cut covenant. We're going to have a, a feast. You know, we'll make this peace treaty. And that's what they go into in verse 31. In the morning, they got up early and exchanged oaths. I swear and I swear. Each saying, you know, what they're bringing to the table, what they're promising, that if I don't keep it, then, then death should come to me. Um, and I lost my place. Sorry. Um, they, oh, I missed that they ate and drank. Okay. So that night, they did have the ceremonial. They had the feast. They had the celebration. Now in the morning, they get up and um, they... In the morning, they got up early and exchanged the oaths, and Isaac, Yitzhak, sent them away, and they left in peace. So they made a peace treaty. It was mutual. It was non-aggressive. It was like Abraham made nearly a century before. When there was contention, they did finally settle. Abraham stood up for his rights at that time, but then they did settle. So this could have even been a renewal your father Abraham made this covenant with our, 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 few, our former leader. Now we're this generation. We want to continue that. So it could have been a continuation or it could have been a whole new. It doesn't really matter whichever way. They were making this um, formal in their time. You know, they, they're putting teeth to it in their time. Um, so... Uh, Okay, and so they left in peace. I'm looking for, yeah, I don't want to say the next thing yet. Okay, now it came about on the same day. So they've had the night before, they had the feast and the ceremony. The morning they made the oath. Yitzhak sent them away on that same day. Yitzhak's servants came in and they told him about the well which they had dug. So obviously while this is going on with Isaac, his men were out working. They were digging and digging and digging, and they found a well. And they said, hallelujah, we found water. They hit pay dirt. They weren't going to be dependent on just a cistern. They've got another well here. Remember, Isaac's the man of wells. So Isaac, in verse 33, called it Shiva, or Sheba is what it looks like here. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Up to this time, it was called Beersheba, just the well. Now, because of Isaac's, he has got another well here, and it's his, this whole area is his. Now, the whole area is being called, being called the well of the, of the oath. The well of the oath, the oath of the well. The well of the oath. The well where the oath took place. I'm sorry, I'm saying it so poorly. It's the well of the oath. Sheva also means seven in Hebrew. And remember, there's seven wells that are associated with Isaac, and here is our seventh. So he's coming into a complete picture, into that perfect time of rest. Um, one of the great theological fathers, Spurgeon by name, if you're familiar with Spurgeon and his works, he says, after you've drunk from the waters of contention and hatred, remember the two wells earlier, sitting on Essex, You'll be brought to Rehoboth. You'll be bought, brought to where there is room. And then you'll even be brought to Beersheba, the well of the oath. The seventh well, the one that's going to satiate you. The one that even your enemies will come and seek your favor and you will glorify the Lord. Beautiful, complete picture. As we see Isaac with his seventh well here in that area called now and forever called, I guess, Beersheba. Because it's still called that today. You can find Beersheba on the map in Israel. So we've got a good place that Yitzhak is in. So all oh, life is good. They lived happily ever after, right? <laughs> and Patty looks at me and laughs. <laughs> Not quite. We've got another problem that's going to come up 
This is a, a natural sequel to the profaneness that we saw of Esau. We saw that he didn't esteem his birthright. In fact, he despised it. That's what the scripture said. He despised his birthright, so he's willing to sell off for a mess of lentil beans, for a, for a meal, okay? Now, that reveals his true inner character. He did not care about the spiritual connection to that birthright. He didn't care about anything other than feeding his physical appetite. And in that same way, we're going to see his inner condition again in what he does. Because verse 34 says, when Esau was 40 years old, he married. Nothing wrong there. I can't stop there with my comment. <laughs> but who did he marry? He married Judith, or Judith the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Basimot, or Basimot, the daughter of Alon, the Hittite. Okay, so he's married two girls, and they come from his family? No, from, from the enemy lines. From the lines, really, when we follow the Hittite line, it's the is in Canaan, is in Canaan, but we follow it back, it's the curse line. It's the line that Ham, Ham from Noah, it came down in his line, and God cursed that line because of Ham's great sin. Now here's my question. Were they the only women available for Esau no. to marry? <laughs> you don't think so, Loretta? <laughs> I would agree because we see Yitzhak he needed a bride. When there wasn't one in the area, the servant went got a bride and brought a bride who would be a worthy bride to Yitzhak from the family, who would be a spiritual mate, who would be worshiping the one true and living God. Now, you don't think that Isaac would think, hmm, I need to be concerned about my sons and who they marry the same way dad was concerned about who I married. Dad didn't just let me marry anybody. I was, I was missing my mom. I was alone. I was on my own. It, it, was, it was sad. I was plenty old enough to, to marry, and we need to be concerned about our line continuing because it's, it can't end with Isaac. The seed has to come from this line. So Isaac really should have been on top of this with his sons or at least with the son of promise. And we're going to see something does happen in that area. But right now, and, and think of even Avraham, when he married again after Sarah had died, he married Keturah, and very likely she was in his household. She was probably a, a granddaughter of um, one of the older ones in, in Sarah's generation, maybe, maybe probably at least down to granddaughter. He probably married young because she has lots of children, okay? So he didn't marry somebody that was close to his age. He married younger. But again, the idea is they married compatible spiritually, married in the line that was the, the spiritual line, didn't look to the outside, didn't marry the Canaanite line, didn't marry into the cursed line. Isaac was 100. Esau was old enough. It showed Esau didn't care anything about um, the promised seed, about being in line for that, which if he gotten the birthright, he would be in line for that. This was going to go to the one who would be the one who the seed would continue, you know, through. So if Esau cared, even though he had done wrong and already sold off that birthright, he could have attempted here, I'll marry in the right line. Maybe I'll get back in favor with God. But we see he doesn't do that. He also takes two wives. And we don't see in Scripture that that's God's will for marriage. Did he allow it? Yes. We saw many who had more than one wife in Bible times. But it isn't the way, you know, God gave one wife to Isaac. You know, God, God gave one wife to, to Abraham. It was Sarah's, let me bring in my handmaid that caused the problem. So all the way around, we're seeing Esau is showing who his inner character is, who, what he's really like. He does not have a spiritual heart. He's not intent on pleasing his God. 
He's not intent about being sure that the mother of his children who will guide his children will be a good spiritual mama. No, I think he had an eye for the women. He saw a couple beauties and I want her and oh, I'm not going to stop there. I want her too. And he mm -hmm. took them both. And I just have to ask Yitzhak, Isaac, where was your head when you wanted to give him the birthright? When you wanted to bless this one who is now brought in the heathen line, the ungodly line, to be the, the mother of, what were you thinking? That's a sneak preview for what's coming, okay? <laughs> and we're going to get into it a lot in this next chapter. We're going to talk about all four of our people in our story, Yitzhak and Rivka, Isaac and Rebecca, and the twins, Esau and um, Jacob, Yaakov. We're going to talk about all four, where they were at spiritually, what, what pictures we're seeing. But notice how this chapter ends. Esau's married two girls, both Hittites, both, as Loretta said so clearly and so well, of the enemy lines. And were they great for the family? No. It says verse 35, they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, I'm not going to ask how many have children here who have married those who brought grief into the home. But if you've ever been involved in anything like that, um, it, it is just, I'll tip my hand because what if everybody doesn't make it back for class next week? We have to realize also in this, because Esau thinks that he's going to get the birthright and the blessing. He's the one that would be, if Isaac dies first, he'd be the one to take care of Rebecca. Now, he, of course, it's his wives that are going to help. Can you imagine the heathen wives helping the spiritual Rebecca? There's not going to be peace in the home. There's not going to be on the same page. Rebecca wants to worship God, and they're saying, oh, let's put a little idol here. Let's bow down to this idol. Let's do this. Let's do that. There was no fellowship, and as it's already said, it brought grief into the home. Let me also show you Esau's character. It's not just that I'm assassinating his character, but look at Hebrews 12, and this will be the verse that, that we close with today. I won't run us over quite as bad as sometimes. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 16. In Hebrews 12, verse 16, it says that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. So scripture calls Esau immoral and godless. He married godless women. They brought grief into the family, but they're not allowed to come into the line that's going to lead down to Messiah. All the more why Esau has negated himself from any right to that birthright. He's done it, he's done it to himself. So when he goes and blames somebody else, he needs to stop and take a good look in the mirror. Okay, I think you have a pretty good idea who I'm going to side with in the next chapter, but it's not because it's Rochelle's choice. It has nothing to do with the fact that Yaakov married Rachel, Rochelle, <laughs> has everything to do with what's presented to us in the Word of God. So next time we will pick up in chapter 27 and we will see what happens. It's going to be time to give the birthright and the blessing. And oh boy, are we in for a... <laughs> yes, Loretta. Yeah, but if you look back in, in the history of Esau, he never really had... Heart we don't see no, any point. Nothing for the family line. He no. no concern. He was a hunter. Just he free, was free. wild. He was in the field. He, yes. All the connotations, all the words the scripture uses, yes, yeah. we don't see it. Yeah, it is. And I will say, because I'm calling out Yitzhak right now, and you know it, but I will say, I do not say Esau is that way because of his father. His father also lived very godly. Didn't live perfectly, but none of us have had a perfect parent. You know, the, that just doesn't happen. But I have seen, and I'm sure you have too, godly homes that produce ungodly children and ungodly homes that produce godly children. It's individual. The individual heart has to be soft toward God or chooses to be hard. The same way that I've told you before, if you put a lump of clay and a lump of wax in the sun, 
one melts and one hardens. But when you think of that light being Yeshua Jesus, the light of the world, when you think of the light being the spiritual, Esau had clay in his heart and he hardened against God. Where ya Yaakov had a love for the things of the Lord. He had the wax. He melted. It doesn't mean he lived a perfect life. He didn't. I'm not going to say he's faultless in this next chapter. But even when he made mistakes, he got back right with his God. Yitzhak, his dad, just made a mistake, got back right. Avraham made a mistake, got back right. God always, God's the God of second chances. Did Isaac get right before he died? No, he, what he did? Oh, let's see what we find out in the scripture. Let's, <laughs> let's go all the way and, and decide when we get to the end of his life. Mm. I like to say in my early ministry, uh, I've seen even inner marriage that is unequal yoke. I've seen the children and the relatives, the stories. <coughs> I know one family, because we had a happy club in my neighborhood. They were mixed. And the, uh, I don't know where the real related was, but the children were really handicapped or their skin or whatever, hearts, pants, I mean, they were young kids that was just, it was sad, but they did receive Christ, but Good. they were going through storms. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. why I never really wanted to go into a really a mixed marriage, because you don't know what the relatives are, you don't know what the background was, even though love is great, but it's better to walk away with a peace of mind than have a headache later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of words of wisdom in there. But especially, especially spiritually, don't be unequally yoked. Yeah. You just, it will never work to your advantage. It will never be a blessing. You need to be on that same page where you can pull together, put the Lord in the center of the marriage. Because I don't know any marriage that doesn't have problems. That's just called life. But when you've got the Lord in the center, you've got both praying, both working toward, I want to please the Lord, both willing to allow the Lord to rub off their rough edges by their mates, because that's part of what happens in a marriage. Well, happy marriage. Not every day, but happy they'll get through their, their trials and their struggles, and they'll come out stronger spiritually if they're both on that same page and willing to work. If they're not, there is, it's just not a good mix. That's why the scripture says, it's in First Corinthians, even, not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And, and I believe spiritually you've got to be on the same page totally too. You can't be in two different doctrinal beliefs because even that will wreak havoc. Now, am I condemning every marriage that's mixed? No, no. There are many who are in that position, whether they went into it that way and shouldn't have, or whether one got saved afterward or whatever, I'm not here. I, it's not for me to judge and it's not for me to say. And I, it doesn't even matter to me if you did. Oops. Isaac oopsed. Abraham oopsed. <laughs> Jacob oopsed. Okay. God can still redeem it. And I will encourage, because the scriptures even say it, if you're with a mate who's not saved and you can live in peace together, do. Don't leave that mate because as that mate sees the Lord through you, doesn't say when you preach it at them and shove it down their throat, <laughs> but when they see you live it, hopefully there's going to be that point where they're going to say, you know, I want what you have to. And that's the prayer and that's the hope as long as your mate's alive. So, you know, please don't even go away feeling condemned, feeling like I'm judging. I am not. Yeah. It, it's just for all of us and, and I'll carry it over into every field and then I'll, I'll close in prayer and, and let you guys have a turn, but I'll carry it over into every field. I don't think business partners should go into business together if they're not both believers. If one is and one isn't, you're going to have trouble there too. The judgment's not going to be there. The decision making's not going to be on the same page and come through in the same way. And more times than not, it will be the unsaved that pulls the believer down. So just not a wise way to go if you're in that place to choose. If you're already in that place with a bad decision or with a change of circumstances or whatever, there's always hope in the Lord. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't think it's all over. How many times through Scripture do we see the impossible 
And what happens? God shows up. So don't give up. Don't give up. Keep, keep it in prayer. Stay on your knees. Get your believing friends to pray with you and see what the hand of the Lord will do. And hopefully, as the scripture even says, the unsaved will become saved because of the believer that's in their lives. So let your light so shine. Okay? <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of second chances. We thank you that you do not judge us and throw us away, that you judge us forgiven through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, and you allow us, even when we make mistakes, to get back on right track with you and to move forward with you. Lord, I pray for the encouragement in anyone's heart who feels that they are being corrected or they need to be and are struggling with that, that they would just come to the foot of the cross and lay that burden down knowing you will love them through it and you will bring them through into a better place. Even as you brought Isaac back into the place where he could worship you, where he could be satiated with your well of living water. For those who are with those that, that are unsaved, whether in a marriage or business or uh, however it's come into their lives, Lord, we do pray, let our light so shine. Let them see you, the Father in heaven, the good works that, that represent you. Let them see an attitude that represents you. And let them be provoked to jealousy, even as we pray for the Jewish people right now, to be provoked to jealousy by the believing Gentiles who have picked up their scriptures, faith in their God, and are acting according to your will and being blessed as the Jewish person should be, but is not if they're not in right fellowship with you. So, Lord, use us if we're believers in a setting that is unsaved. And if we are not, Lord, may we stay close to you and not allow that to come into our lives by our choice. May we make wise and right decisions. But thank you, Lord. You don't look for perfection. And you do work with us and even turn things around for good that literally in our on our side are impossible, but with you all things are possible. You are such a loving and caring, long-suffering, merciful and gracious God. How we thank you, how we praise you, because we all stand in the need of that. So thank you for being tender, shepherd, loving Savior. Thank you also for being the God who does correct us, that we might walk more in your ways, be more pleasing to you and more useful to you too. Lord, let it be so in our lives. In the name of Yeshua Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.